ESPN 1080 The Team presents the ESPN1080.com Insider Show, delivering you the latest news and notes from around the sports world. We got all your local teams covered. The Knights. That's it, ball game over. And the UCF Knights have upset 16 point Florida. The Magic. How is soaring high above the rim? The Rays. A walk off. Home run for Evan Longoria. The Buck. On the roll out. Raymond Gray. Touchdown, Cadillac Williams. And the Knolls. Touchdown up as you. Florida State with Greg Reed going coast to coast. The Insiders are your ticket inside the press box. And now. Your insider. What's up? Welcome back to another edition of the ESPN1080.com Insider Show. We're having a little mic problem right now, but it's all good. Saying what it looks like. <laughs> got it. What's up, guys? I'm Brian Winnegar filling in for Eric Lopez, who is uh, currently at the swamp right now. We're going to get to him, but I'm your MMA insider here at ESPN1080 the team, joined with. Uh, our other insider, Magic Insider, Noel Insider, follow him at Howard the Dunk on Twitter, Andrew Melnick. What's up besides besides the mic uh, holding in your hand? What's going the, on, dude? The mic is actually not up. Right. Uh, <laughs> she's coming off another day with some good college football, a lot of a lot of good action yesterday. Uh, pretty fun stuff. A lot of stuff to talk about today. Yeah, a lot of stuff to get to, and of course, we're joined with uh, the main producer, Mr. David Buckman. What's going on, dude? What's popping? Not much, man. Well. T- Talk about uh, all the stuff we have to talk about, man. We've got baseball playoffs today. We've got full slate of NFL games. It's pretty much my favorite time of the year, wouldn't you say? October? Uh, yeah, every sport is usually going on now. Of course, we don't have uh, basketball, as, as well known, but hockey's coming back. Uh, baseball playoffs started. Football's getting into full swing. It's actually the one time where all four major sports here are going on at the same time. No, I love it. And, of course, we've got some a uh, little bit of NBA uh, news. David Stern will not make the announcement today uh, regarding the postponement of the regular season starting Monday. So that's good, but we'll touch on that afterward. But first, we go to the main man himself, Mr. Eric Lopez, who was at the biggest game, the nation, uh, yesterday. Eric, what's going on, man? Uh, gentlemen, I can literally tell you that I am calling you literally from inside Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. I just walked in here, and I'm sitting in front of the end zone here as we're doing this interview. Huh? huh? Hey, How great is that? Huh? Hey, man, you, you know some people, apparently. But uh, first off, <laughs> first off, the game, uh, talk about the game. The game started off within the first quarter, looked pretty tight. Then things kind of unraveled for Florida. What were your uh, first opening takes on the game? Well, I think, first of all, the atmosphere was magnificent. Second largest crowd in the history of Ben Hill Griffith Stadium, 90,888. The only one that was bigger was the uh, Tim Tebow's last game, which I think, Andrew, you were there, right, for that one? Uh, no, skip that one. You uh, skipped that one? Well, rightly so. Ugly. <laughs> ugly game that was for me. Yeah, I don't, that's a blur game there. It turned out to be Bobby Bowden's last uh, regular season game. But, no, Florida got off to a good start. Uh, Brantley, who I thought played well, hit uh, DeBose on the big 60-yard touchdown. Uh, I thought the Gators had good success early, but Alabama, I thought, made some good adjustments, and their line of scrimmage kind of took over as the game went on. Uh, the difference, I thought, the turning point was when Courtney Upshaw got the pick six off Brantley to go up 17-10 halfway through the second quarter. And then from that point on, Trent Richardson just took over, who's a beast, 186 yards on the ground. I, he's my front runner for the Heisman Trophy right now, and he might be better than Mark Ingram, in my opinion. I've seen them both in person, and uh, Richardson's just explosive. Um, Alabama's just so impressive, and Andrew knows I voted him number one all year long in my poll, and that's going to stay that way. Well, that, of course, Trent Richardson had 29 carries, 181 yards, and two scores. Going into the game, we all thought it was going to start up front. Um, Alabama has yet to allow a 10-yard or a rush of over 10 yards or more, and after this game, still that fact. How dominant was the Alabama's front line against uh, Demps in the Florida running game? Well, very dominant. I mean, Florida was at minus 13 rushing in the first half. I mean, Bama's, you could tell, they were clearly determined. They were not going to let Demps or Rainey beat them. They were going to say, John Brantley, you're going to beat us through the air. And while Brantley had success early in the game, it just did not, uh, it was not going to last. And then once it became one-dimensional, Alabama's pass rush took over and eventually knocked out Brantley, which we'll get into. But uh, Alabama's athletes are magnificent. I mean, it it is unbelievable, Brian. To give you a perspective on it, I mean, you've been to a UCF game. I would compare the uh, Bama defense, the UCF defense. UCF's like Sega Genesis, and Alabama's an Xbox. 
Hey, I used to like Sega Genesis. Uh, on the other, on the <laughs> other Sega side, that's what I'm saying. We all like Sega Genesis. Oh, that's what classic, you're saying. man. On, on the other side of the lines, you know, the Florida's defense line was supposed to be the strength of their team, and it, it could still be a lot of youth there. Were you surprised at all of how dominant the Alabama run game was, how, how good up front they were on the offensive line? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I knew Alabama's goal was to do that. I was surprised. I thought Florida's defensive line would put up a better effort than that. But give Alabama's offensive line credit. They, for the second year in a row, they were just more physical than the Florida defensive line. Uh, I thought McCarron made some nice throws early uh, to kind of keep them honest. Uh, but Trent Richardson is just a beast. And, oh, by the way, Lacey ain't bad either. He got that last touchdown in the game. But that was a surprise. And, and that was the thing. Even though Florida had the lead early, late in the first quarter, you had a sense with the way Alabama was moving the ball on the ground that if things didn't change quickly. Florida was in for a long night, and unfortunately for the Gators, they were. I was surprised. I thought for the Gators to have a chance, which I thought they had a shot to win this game, believe it or not. Uh, I thought their defensive line would contain Richardson and force McCarron to throw. It turns out it was completely wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And when you look at A.J. McCarron, you mentioned him with, made a couple of nice throws. 12-25, 140 yards, kind of another ho-hum game for him. Are they going to need better play from him going forward when they play, you know, an LSU, maybe another team in the SEC Championship, and Auburn, who had an impressive win yesterday? I think so. I know in talking to the Alabama media after the game, they feel that McCarron, you know, I don't think he was pressured. I mean, he obviously spent two timeouts early in the Florida atmosphere. I think that'll make him a better quarterback having gone through that. But, yeah, I think when, now let's be honest, I mean, everybody's now talking about the showdown with LSU in November. That's what everybody's really pointing to now that mega matchup in Tuscaloosa, he's going to have to make some throws because I don't think Alabama will be able to run the football on the LSU front uh, like they did against Florida. I mean, you, those two teams are going to be, bo- be really going at it. And uh, I think McCarron's got to hit a higher percentage. I thought he had some bad reads. I don't know how it came out on television. I mean, that meal in the press box, he had some wide-open guys. There was one in the back of the end zone in the first quarter he missed. Uh, he went to the back. He, he had a couple of bad reads. He's got to do a better job of reading the defenses there. Sometimes he kind of just looks at one or two options and just goes there. It does not really look at the entire field. Um, but as long as you got Trent Richardson in your backfield and that defense, you know, you don't have to be anything special. Of course, we're joined by Eric Lopez, host of the ESPN1080.com Insider Show. All right, Eric, Alabama started off this what would be um, – gauntlet, if you will, for Florida coming up on the, the, the home schedule. They got at LSU next, at Auburn, and then Georgia. After yes. this, wor- the worst defeat, home defeat for Florida in eight years, wh- what, if any, mindset does Florida have going into this ridiculous schedule? Well, I mean, the question, number one, immediately is, what is the status of John Brantley with his knee? It looked pretty bad. Uh, the replay, uh, Florida said afterwards they really didn't know anything. I think they were kind of sugarcoating it. I think they have an idea. They're just not going to let you know. That's just the way it is. Uh, they need Brantley. Driscoll looked lost, guys. I, I was not impressed. I mean, granted, it's a, it's a very hard critique. I mean, you're going up against Alabama's defense. Not too many quarterbacks are going to look good. The thing that was surprising me, Driscoll just didn't look comfortable throwing the football. Uh, he, he looked to me very nervous. I mean, he's obviously very mobile. He had that nice 30-plus yard run. Uh, they got people excited, but uh, I was surprised. I thought he'd be more prepared. He didn't look prepared. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he was just a freshman in the big spotlight. Um, I think uh, all indications are if Brantley's not good, he might have to start in Baton Rouge, which is not going to be easy. Um, if that with, with him, they're going to struggle. I mean, LSU is tremendous. Auburn beat South Carolina, as you mentioned. Now, they're, they're playing a lot better than people think. And, of course, and then, it's at Auburn. And it's at you know, Auburn, not an easy place to play. And then they go to Jacksonville against Georgia. They've looked better, they, too. Georgia's, I think, is the biggest winner yesterday. They're the happiest. They beat Mississippi State. They're back in the SEC East race. And as I talked to Brent Beard about it in our post game, uh, I think Georgia right now, you, I think, is the favorites to win the East because South Carolina's situation is a mess with Garcia. I mean, my goodness. I mean, uh, have you ever seen a quarterback that tries to give the game away or just makes dumb decision after dumb decision and – and Spurrier can't pull him. He can't pull him because he doesn't trust any of his quarterbacks, apparently. And uh, with all that talent, I, I think Georgia's right now in the driver's seat. They got Florida and Jacksonville. Uh, they got a good schedule. They don't have to play Alabama. They don't have to play LSU. I think Florida's in trouble. The good news is there's some winnable games in November for Florida once they do get back at home. Uh, but I don't know if they're going to be able to win a game in October right now. 
No, it's going to be tough. Uh, maybe I'm in the minority here, but a, a John Brantley injury to me isn't the end of the world for Florida because they've got this tough schedule. And, you know, if we're being realistic here, it's a rebuilding year. I mean, this is a team who at best could maybe have won the East. And now instead you're going to make that transition. They're making a transition to a new offense. They're running a complete 3-4 defense now. So as they make that transition playing Jeff Driscoll the rest of the year, I think it's going to get them a ton of experience in these games, and it's going to set them up better for next year when they have a better team coming back. Well, I agree with that, except the question is, are we confident that Driscoll is a good fit for this system? Like, I got the sense he might be a better fit for the Urban Meyer spread offense than he is for the pro offense. I don't know if you, uh, Andrew, if you agree. He's got legs, that's for sure. He's got legs. I'm just not sure he is a drop-back passer that would fit the Charlie White system. Now, you're right. He'll get experience and he's going to get better, but I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if he fits the system. Remember, he's not a Will Muschamp recruit. He was an Urban Meyer recruit. Uh, I'm wondering if he fits the system. And I think he might be what Brantley was a year ago. He didn't fit the Urban Meyer system. Um, you're right. I think from the from that standpoint, it is a rebuilding year if you're Florida. It's all about next year. You got all the the guy, most of the guys coming back. You got a good recruiting class. You're with Muschamp, from what I understand. Uh, a lot of recruits were at this game, by the way, last night. It was tremendous. I mean, it was uh, unbelievable. It was like at least 50, 60 guys on the field. But uh, I think they'll be fine next year and beyond. But I'm not 100% sold on Jeff Driscoll yet. Eric, I know Alabama is by far, or close to by far, being the best defensive team in the nation. But, I mean, after this performance, are Rainey and Demps, are they that good? Are they as good as we thought they were even a week ago? Yeah, I think they're very good. You give credit to Alabama. Now, LSU will get mad with you, Brian, because they're going to tell you that they're better than Alabama right. defensively. Um, Demps and Rainey are very good, but I thought Alabama had a great scheme. Uh, they're linebackers. As we talked about, Brian, on the pregame preview on the podcast with uh, with Roger Franklin Williams and, uh, Ken Allen. You know, and Ken Allen, they, and Ken made the great point. Alabama's linebackers stayed with Demps and Rainey. They, they're, they're athletic enough to stay with those guys. Not too many people can say that in the nation. They did that. They shut them down completely. And we talked about the backfield matchup between Richardson and Lacey for Alabama against Dempsey and Rainey. Well, clearly Alabama won that easily. They could thank their offensive linemen, as Nick Saban said in the postgame. But nonetheless, they did a tremendous job against them. Alabama's defense is tremendous athletes. I mean, they only lost Marcel Darius from last year. I mean, as Andrew knows, he follows it closely. I mean, Upshaw is probably going to be a first-round draft pick. He was a beast. I thought he was a difference maker at linebacker with a big interception. He had a sack. He was, a, he was just a force. Uh, they got a good secondary. They got burned on that one play by DeBose, but after that, they shut him down completely. The other thing I'd be concerned if I'm Florida is the playmakers on offense, like DeBose, he's got a pattern now. He'll make a play early in the game, whether it be a kick return or you know catch a bomb, and then he disappears. And Thompson, very quiet. And these were two guys that they depended on very heavily, and they have not really, uh, really excelled yet to this point. Yeah, and this is Alabama playing without starting linebacker C.J. Mosley. You remember him? He had a interception for a touchdown in the Florida game last year. Makes it even more impressive. Uh, Alabama, it, it, it's tough to argue that anyone's been much more impressive than them. One team, before we let you go, I want to I want to get your comments on. I haven't been a believer. I don't think anyone has. But now three straight wins over teams in the top 25, and the most impressive one in Blacksburg yesterday, the Clemson Tigers. It looks like they're for real. I think so. I mean, Clemson's got the talent. That's a big win to go in Blacksburg. Virginia Tech clearly has got some issues there. That division might be a little bit more wide open than people think now. Logan Thomas has definitely failed in the expectations. Oh, he was uh, brutal bad, brutally bad yesterday. But Clemson's very good, no doubt. I mean, yesterday was a big blow for Florida State. I think Clemson now is in great shape to win the division. I still think Clemson will drop a game. they got to drop uh, two for, for Florida State. But they're going to have to time. drop two, and Florida State is going to have to win out in the ACC to have any chance of winning that division. Clemson's certainly legit. Uh, you give them credit. Uh, you know they, they've done a heck of a job when you beat Auburn, Florida State, and Virginia Tech three straight weeks in a row. That's a, that's a heck of an accomplishment. They should be in the top ten very easily uh, when the polls come out. So I thought it was a, you know they did a very good job. They were very impressive. And then you know they Virginia Tech I think got some work cut out for them. If you're Georgia Tech, if you're Miami, even in North Carolina, you got to feel pretty good this morning because you've got a shot to win this division. Well, Eric, with you and, and our man David Bugman behind the glass, <laughs> how happy. Were the two of you, how how good did you feel Thursday night after those two straight UCF losses to see the Bulls just get pounded at Pittsburgh? Very good to see South Florida get blown out. I mean, if you're South Florida, it's the same story every year. You do great non-conference, 
And then for whatever reason, you get exposed in the Big East. I mean, Pittsburgh just ran all over South Florida. Uh, defensively, I was very surprised. They really had no answer there. And, you know, South Florida's got a tricky Big East schedule. they got to go to Rutgers. Well, I think he's kind of sneaking up on people. Shiano did a nice win in Syracuse yesterday. Uh, you know, the Big East is open. I, it's West Virginia's to lose, basically, in my view. Uh, and I think if you're South Florida, boy, you have that bad feeling of going 8-4 and four again. You know, and it's like, here we go again. And, uh, boy, Pitt took him to the woodshed. Uh, I think UCF fans at least enjoyed that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, South Florida certainly, uh, I, I think Skip will get them to bounce back. But, yeah, I mean, they were definitely got some holes. Well, at the close of this weekend, the last remaining Florida school notched a loss under their belt. What There was so much going into Florida, Florida college football going into the season. With the, with the uh, USF loss and Florida loss, what 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 what's the state of, of Florida football right now? Well, I mean it's okay. It's just uh, you know you're obviously you're disappointed. I mean I think Florida State two losses is tough, but they had some injuries. Do you, do you think there was too much hype going into the season? No, I, I don't think there's too much. Where's there always hype? This, this, there's always going to be hype in the Sunshine State. There's yeah, expectations. of course. This is the this is I mean this state is all about college football. Let's be honest, and Andrew knows that as well as I do. I mean this this state lives on college football, so. Uh, this thing, this state dominated the, the the country in the '80s and the '90s, and uh, they the high expectations, at least for Florida, Florida State, and Miami. Anyway, has always been national championships, and I think you got teams like South Florida and UCF are trying to get to that level and win conference championships consistently and get to that level. Uh, but yeah, I think you would say right now, if you're, if you're a fan in the Sunshine State, you're a little disappointed, no matter who you are. If you're a Gator, I think you're a little disappointed tonight because I think you would have hoped. They would have been a little more competitive with Alabama. If you're Florida State, you're disappointed because you're right now, as you wake up this morning after seeing Clemson blow out Virginia Tech, you're 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 staring at a possible Champ Sports Bowl birth, which is not what the expectations <laughs> were. And you know, I love the Champ Sports Bowl. I've covered it, but not what Florida State had in mind. They were hoping to go to the Orange Bowl. Miami's got their issues. It's been well documented. I think UCF is probably the most disappointing team of the state, just from the standpoint. They lost to an FIU team that lost to Duke and Louisiana Lafayette now, back-to-back weeks. Uh, that is not good, and BYU is fortunate to beat Utah State. Uh, I think if you're a UCF fan, this team should have been a top-25 team, and they're not, and they got offensive issues. And if you're South Florida, you had a great non-conference, you beat Notre Dame, a great moment in your program, but yet you follow it up by getting blown out by, I think, a very below-to-average pit team on national television. So, uh I think you're, if you're in the Sunshine State right now, you're all a little bummed yeah. out uh, uh, to some extent right now. And unfortunately, we don't have pro football to really get excited about, unless maybe you're a Bucks fan. But that's about it. I probably, Carson, I, Bobby Carson is in the stadium with me. Is he uh, really? He hung out with a lot of Buckman's friends, which he can tell you about. You can have him on here a little later, and he can kind of give you a fan perspective. He was hanging out with the uh, Gator people and everything. But uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think the Sunshine State right now is a little uh, depressed, a little bummed out, and. No, I, I probably shouldn't have asked that question right when I asked it. All these, all these guys in the studio were mean mugging me. But hey, speak about cars. How was that car ride to Gainesville together? What did you guys talk about? It was a good ride. We were talking about Brian and why Brian Whitaker didn't just come up here. I mean, we're, I think Carson was a little disappointed. You know, I'm show you the Gainesville trip. <laughs> only, only top five matchups for Brian. That, that, that's that's it. Trip. Him Brian, watch. yeah, Brian's got a high standard now. He only goes to top five games. I got you. Now that's. Uh, by the way, gentlemen, I did. I could tell you some notes from the press box. Incredible spread. I mean, you could have everything: spaghetti, you had pizza, you had uh, ice cream, cake, chicken, ticket. They have it for you. Uh, Mert, I met Vern Lundquist. Great guy, uh, tremendous guy uh, off the air. Tremendous guy. Uh, it was just a tremendous treat. To a ton of media there. Open box, open uh, window, no windows. It was an open. Come on, you're gonna uh, make me regret this decision, Eric. That's what I'm. That's why I'm mentioning this. It was tremendous. <laughs> uh, it was fantastic. And the Florida people, the athletic department, were tremendous class acts. Uh, tremendous, regardless. Uh, you know, they were uh, tremendous. And I think other schools uh, should follow their lead in how to run a, a university and how to run a football operation, uh, in particular in Orlando. Well, good stuff, Eric. You can hang on the line with us, or yeah, what? Yeah, definitely. I can definitely hang out, baby. It's a beautiful 70 degree day in Gainesville. We're here at the Swamp, a great stadium, and more importantly, and I think Andrew would agree with me, I mean, unfortunately, it's a little depressed here in Gainesville, but I think me and Andrew are kind of yeah, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly makes a two-game losing streak similar to what I just asked you about USF feel a little bit better. All right, All right then, that was Eric Lopez calling live from the Swamp. Eric's going to stick around with us. Coming up next on ESPN1080.com Insider Show.
Talk a little Major League Baseball. How come, you wonder why we didn't get tremendous treats. Right? You've been listening to ESPN 1080.com Insider Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to ESPN 1080.com Insider Show. I'm your host, Brian Winnegar, MMA Insider. Joined, of course, by Andrew Melnick, Magic, Seminole Insider. Follow him at Howard the Dunk on Twitter. What's going on, Andrew? Uh, nothing. I guess now I'm going to play uh, Collapsing Fan. Right, Insider. I know. You're the Boston fan. I want to get your take on this. And, of course, we're always produced by the man, the myth, the legend, David Buckman. I didn't know I was a man, myth, and legend. You are. I, well, I knew I was a man. You are. Not the myth and legend. Not the myth. And we are uh, currently joined by uh, the host of this show, Eric Lopez, on the line, calling from the swamp. But he's got some takes on the baseball game. Yeah, by the way, me and Carson are literally throwing passes right here, right? We're Andre DeBose here. Let me get you Carson on first. I would seconds. love to see Carson throw a 15-yard pass. How, how, Boys. How's his arm? What? Was this Carson? Carson. Gentlemen, greetings. Greetings. Good morning. You're going to weigh in on these baseball games or what? Absolutely. Sir. Okay. I can't believe you're up. I, I can't believe you're up either. I can't believe you're up. Oh. We, uh, you know what, it just kind of happened, guys. You know, I woke up at 8 o'clock, I just kind of, you know, nuffled myself awake, and I was, like, ready to go. So, you know, it was pretty impressive. I was happy with myself, and, uh, you know, it was good. Man, a boy. Well, before we get into the game, the playoffs that are currently going on, yes, I want to talk about the end of what I feel and what a lot of people feel was the best ending to a regular season in the history of sure. baseball. For you guys. For yeah. us. We got, For, uh, of yeah. course, we enjoyed our it. Boston Red Sox fan in here, Andrew Melnick. Yeah, Andrew, I'm sorry, I, Andrew. I want your. Uh, was this the biggest collapse in history? Uh, maybe, any team, maybe, any maybe, team. Maybe we look back at when they collapsed and, and were beaten by Bucky Dent in the one-game playoff too. That was, that was maybe even more painful because they did lose the final game to New York for for Red Sox fans. But I, I, of course, luckily was not born yet. Right, didn't have to deal with that. But it, it really might have been, and you know, we've been talking about this coming for weeks. I mean, I, I've been—I haven't just been being the pessimist, right. the classic Red Sox fan. I mean, you could just see with all the injuries, with the way they were playing, with no one—not even John Lester and, and Josh Beckett—able to pitch real good, complete six, seven inning, you know, or further into the games. We kind of saw this coming the whole time. I mean, it didn't take a, a, I mean, a miracle last game for Tampa, uh, maybe, but it didn't take Tampa playing. Completely out of their mind. They went 17 and 10 last month, which was impressive. But I think it was more about Boston's collapse, maybe, than it was about Tampa winning. I've got a question. Yeah, that, that's right, right there. I've got Buckman. a question for Andrew. I, I want to know. First of all, you can't agree with that Terry Francona decision. That, that's pretty tough. And second of all, you know, what do the Red Sox need to do, in your opinion? Uh, no, I don't agree with it at all. I mean, this guy has been fantastic since he's been there. I guess there's a lot of rumors of him losing losing the clubhouse. Guys boozing during the game. Out, I love that. Out in the bullpen and Gain, it, gaining it, weight during the season. Yeah, if this is all true and he had lo lost the locker room, I mean, we'll never truly know what happened in there. If that's all true, then maybe you could see it. But, I mean, this guy's the best manager they've ever had. He seemed to always handle those egos well. The Ortiz, you know, Manny Ramirez for a while. The idiots? Yeah, the idiots. These guys with these like, larger-than-life personalities and, you know, a lot of great players. He seemed to handle them really well. He seemed to get along with them really well. And it's pretty unfortunate the way it ended because, I mean, let's think what this team was before he got there. I mean, he gets a World Series sure. his first year, wins another three years later. Uh, you know, they've had 95 wins almost every year he's been there except for, I think, three of the years. So five of the eight years they've had at least 95 wins. I mean, he's done... An incredible job there. Oh, incredible job. And here's some set. Six times 90-plus wins, a 574 winning percentage, two World Series rings, of course, and he was there for eight years, which was the second longest tenure at a Red Sox manager behind Joe Cronin. For, he had 13 years. But but no, that's why I think this might be the, the biggest collapse because it wasn't just a collapse, yeah, we didn't make the playoffs. It's kind of an end of an era in Boston, if you will. Well, and, 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 you know, I think a good point about that, too, Brian, is it's not like the Rays exactly lit the world on fire in September. Right. I think there was something like 16 and 10 for the month. Right. And that's, not a, that's not amazing. You know, it's good, but it's certainly not, it's certainly not otherworldly. Right, but I, I agree with Andrew. If it, once you lose that clubhouse, it's kind of like, okay, you need a new voice. And that's what Terry Francona came out and said. My voice right, no longer holds with this clubhouse. And, you know, eight years in a town like Boston, that's like... 20 years, you know, in yeah. Tampa or, or anywhere else. For, for him, too, with his, all the success he had, 
uh, you know, it was great, but all he did was put more pressure on himself. I mean, they turned from a lovable loser type team to a team that's expected to win every year now, you know, with the huge payroll, third highest payroll in the league this year. Uh, they're expected to win every year now, so the guy got added pressure to himself. I mean, I'm sure he wouldn't trade the two the two titles for anything, but he added a ton of pressure to himself, and now he could have the, an even crazier new look because, you know, there's rumors that the Red Sox are going to let Theo Epstein talk to the Cubs, maybe lose him, let him go to Chicago. Uh, it's a little surprising. Theo Epstein, from the area, grew up a Red Sox fan, um, you know, is one of those big stack guys from Yale. I'm sure Boston will find another stack guy if that happens, but that could be the case, or, or Carson and all you guys who have been supporting the Rays, the other name we've heard for the Cubs is Andrew Friedman. Yeah, well, the, the only thing I think with Friedman is he's so close to Stuart Stein, Sternberg and the ownership in Tampa. That, that's the one thing I think that really that keeps him in St. Pete, although, I mean, there's been a lot of rumors. Of course, Houston's got an opening, and, and he's from Houston, and, and certainly the big market jobs are appealing, Chicago, where, wherever you know he may land, but I, I think that, that he stays in Tampa, but there's certainly, I mean, a lot of people that, that want the services of Andrew Friedman after all the Rays have done these past few years. Yeah, Friedman, of course, the executive vice president of baseball operations, so basically serves as the GM there in Tampa. Right. Francona's not done, right? He's going to manage somewhere else. There's, I mean, like you mentioned, Chicago, the White Sox, he's been White in that Sox. organization before. He, Jerry Reinsdorf, you know, he, he managed some Chicago farm. Michael leagues. Jordan. Michael manager. Jordan. Michael Jordan's manager, exactly. But um, there's no, there's no way. It might take him a, a year or so. Yeah, I think, I think he needs a little break. Need a break after this season. <laughs> right. But anyway, let's get into the team that actually overcame yep. the Red Sox, the Rays. Man, they, uh, you know, le- le- yesterday was kind of uh, they were up. Texas came back, tied the series. But uh, Carson, I want to talk to you about Game One and Matt Moore. Sure. Matt unbelievable. Moore, unbelievable. Uh, making his what second start? Yeah, yeah. Being brought up <laughs> to start, to start, first the, start too. yeah, to start the ALDS. Now you got Matt Matt Moore coupled with David Price. How dangerous are Tampa is Tampa Bay going into the playoffs right well, now? Well, I, I think they certainly have the best staff in the American League. I don't I don't think you can challenge the Phillies overall, but but in terms of their rotation in the American League, I certainly think it's the best one. And and uh, Matt Moore, that was my call. I, I wanted Matt Moore to start that game. Very excited that, you know, there was rumors that Jeff Neiman would start, and then they went with Moore later uh, the night before. So I, I was very excited that they went with him, and, and he certainly looked dominant. I mean, you really can't do any better than he did. And the Rays really, you know, helped a young guy out. I think that was important to get out to an early lead, give him some confidence behind him. You know, they just they went all out on C.J. Wilson in that game, and, and that, was, that was huge because, you know, if you pad, you know, a rookie starter there in the playoffs, I mean, it gets him off on a good foot. It gets him rolling. And then he sees, hey, this postseason thing, eh, it's not that difficult. Right. Yeah. Go, go a couple months back to on our YouTube page, and you can hear us interview yeah. Matt Moore back That's when right. he was still in Durham. That's right. All right, I'm going to pose this question to both of you guys. Baseball is a sport unlike no other, where I feel momentum is just so key. Um, these teams that, that go on these late-season runs and kind of sneak into the playoffs, I feel they're more dangerous than these teams like the Yankees and these teams that Phillies that have been, you know, they knew they were going to be in the playoffs and kind of wind down a little bit. Do you agree with that? Do you think? Well, you- yeah, I, I, I do to some extent. I think it depends. I mean, obviously, my Cardinals, uh, you know, going against a team like Philadelphia, I mean, that's a talent mismatch. Philadelphia, the way better baseball team there. So, so they're going to win out every day. But I certainly think a team like the Rays, who I really believe can compete at least with anyone in the American League, that's a huge advantage for them, and I see no reason why, because of the role that they're on, there's really little, you know, last year they came into the playoffs with a lot of pressure on them. They figured this is the last year, we've got guys like Crawford, you know, we're going to lose all these players in the off season, and we need to make one more run at it. Well, now they're really playing with house money, and, and these guys are, are just, I think, loose, carefree, and certainly that makes a very dangerous team in the postseason. Yeah, I kind of agree with it, too, because we're not going to see, you know, with the Yankees, we're not going to see guys like Scott Proctor pitching in the playoffs. You're not going to see these guys with their numbers in the 60s and 70s playing in games. And there's been some examples. I mean, we saw the first year, you know, the ones I'm familiar with, the first year Boston won in 2004, they were nine, ten games behind New York, hit a big home run off Mario Rivera, kind of rode that the rest of the year, and then we saw... Angels uh, no the, two, the and Angels Gi- no two, and Giants last year. The Giants last year, the Rockies, when they lost right. Boston in the World Series, went on a ridiculous run, I think won something like 21 out of 22 games, and went on their way all the way to the World Series, so we've seen it happen before. 
Well, yeah, I was going to basically go where you went there with the Rocky. It kind of went back there. I mean, teams just, most of the time they're able to, you know, get into the playoffs. And the Giants were the rare case, and, and then your Angels, too, you know, a team that actually won the World Series. But most of the time these teams can get past the first round just based off of, you know, being hot. And then the talent might take over when they play against, you know, the Yankees, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Red Sox, a team that, you know, has been waiting just to get there. So, yeah. you know, at some point, I think the talent does, you know, overtake and, and being we, hot. And we can't act like these teams, the Giants last year, who had the best pitching staff. I mean, the Angels were pretty loaded in 2 You know, Boston was loaded in 4 So we can't say these teams were, you know, void of talent. No, I mean, and it, most of these teams that do win are teams that are, you know, stacked with pitching. Pitching. And pitching. that's what's winning. I mean, defense wins championships in football, and pitching wins championships in baseball. You need at least one power pitching ace at the top of your rotation who can shut down teams. Tampa's got about ten. Ta- Tampa's got about ten. I, I, like, I like Tampa the way that they're going. Okay, game three, we're all tied up, tied up at one. I want to go uh, start with Andrew. Who do you like in game three? Uh, I think I like Tampa um, with, with, with David Price going against Colby Lewis. I like that matchup, even though Price was, we'll just say, pretty awful in his last start of the year. But he's been pretty awful against New York all season. I think that was more just Mark Teixeira getting him in spots uh, more so than David Price slowing down, even though he had a bad last month of the season. I'm going to trust him over Colby Lewis, and I'm going to say the Rays actually get a home win, which is something they did not do against Texas last season. Yeah, Andrew, I was at that blowout game last year when they uh, when C.J. Wilson faced the Rays, and that was yeah. not fun. I will be no home team at the Trop. Uh, that's right. I will be at the Trop tomorrow, and, and I'm very excited. I think Jeremy Hellickson, that's a great pitching matchup. I really like Hellickson's style for the postseason. He's had a great year. Yeah, I think he's going to keep hitters off balance, a little bit uh, different of a look than the other guys in the Rays staff, and then I do uh, side with Tampa there for game three. I think they take the advantage. Should be interesting, and like you said, back to the trop uh, tomorrow. Absolutely. Or uh, Tuesday. Either or. Anyway. Both, actually. Both. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're not wrong. That was uh, Carson Engel calling live from the swamp. Thank you very much, Carson. Say, I, I have to say, Brian, you are a fantastic host. Oh, thank it you. It is a talent that uh, I did not know you had about a week ago, but you have risen to the occasion. And Buckman, I know you loved getting out that uh, shout-out for the Rockies. I know you love Rocktober. He Rocktober, baby. All right, Carson. Thanks, buddy. Yes, sir. Take care. All right, guys. When we get back, we've got some Sunday NFL football. We're talking a little Tom Brady, one of my favorite subjects, and I know Andrew's the same. I see him, see him smiling over there. I, I have a dog named Brady. <laughs> All right, guys. When we get back, a little NFL talk. You're listening to the ESPN1080.com Insider Show on ESPN 1080 The Team. Welcome back to the ESPN1080.com Insider Show. I'm Brian Winnegar, your MMA insider, which we'll get to in a little bit. There Joy- was, yeah, there was an event last night. There was night. an event last night. Pretty excited. Bantamweight t- championship fight. Joined, of course, by our Magic and Knowles insider. Follow this guy at Howard the Dunk on Twitter, Andrew Melnick. What's going on, dude? Uh, nothing. In, in, enjoying a little two-man show. Well, I guess it's kind of three-man. It's kind of three. those guys on the phone. Exactly. one. We've got, of course, our... Man of the hour. I, I, I announced you every single time differently. David Buck, me. What's going on, our producer? What's up? I'll uh, I'll take whatever I can get. Right. Hey, doing a great job. And uh, on the line, we are joined with the host of this show, Mr. Eric Lopez, calling us again from the swamp. Eric, what's going on? Pretty good. I will. Uh, I will say you're doing a good job as well, hosting Brian. Not no, just stop it. Stop oh. it. Right. I need. I want to host the show here. Uh... Oh, wait, Buckman, you got any recommend- recommendation where we can eat lunch here in Gainesville? Um. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a Zaxby's up there, which is always pretty good. I mean, there's a Zaxby's here, but if you're looking I, for something uh, original, there's a place called Steamers, and it's Steamers. Steamers. What do you call it? Steamers. Steamers. Yeah, and it's uh, it's like chicken and rice, and you get like, and rice, all huh? different kinds of like flavors, like fried rice, and oh man, it's real good. If, if that's open today, I would I would go there. Eric, before we start, I want to know: Does Carson have that much pull in Gainesville like he does in Miami? Does he? Does Carson have enough pull? No. Does he have any pull? Like he does, does he at UCF any, well, or Miami? He's got some pull. He's got some pull. Listen, listen. He's. I don't even know where he was last night. I'll just. Leave and it he knows. Center, right? People know who he is everywhere yeah. he goes in the state of Florida. That's just true. I, okay. He. I think he. Let me tell you how. Let me tell you how much pull he has. He can literally go to a random place house and just stay there, and nobody would care. 
That's how. It, that's how. They won't care now. Not my house. Nobody, nobody cares. They just welcome him in. They welcome him because it's Carson Engel. That's they, how it works here in games. Uh, do they let him sleep like on their couch, or do they keep him on the porch? What do they? What do they? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know where. I, I don't. I don't get into those type of personal details. I, you know, I let wherever he sleeps, he sleeps. It's his business. You right. know what I mean? I, I worry about where I sleep, and that's all I can do. I can only control what I can control. <laughs> <laughs> that that you know, you can't go wrong when you do that. All right. Well, it's Sunday, guys, and you know what happens on Sunday? We got NFL on Sunday. Big slate of games. Haven't started their bye week. We got 16 games going on. Let's start in the state of Florida. Bucks at Colts. Huge Monday night game. You know, Colts 0 3. They had Sunday night football, Sunday night last week. They have Monday night this week. It is amazing how, what a difference having Peyton Manning off that team does for for the Colts, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. But they they showed some signs of life Sunday. They gave Pittsburgh a game. They tied it up late. Uh, they're going to be going to Curtis Painter again, I guess, with Kerry Collins and the concussion. Uh, you know, besides having just some ridiculous sunshine style hair, the guy's barely played any football with Peyton Manning being there. And Tampa got, I don't know, their biggest win, I think, probably in a couple years by finally beating the Falcons. They lost those two close games last year, and they came away with a huge win. Yeah, I love Tampa in this game. They're at home. They're it's at Monday home. night. Indy's in all kind of trouble. They can't run. They can't throw. Defense did play better. I think they'll be able to get a little bit of a pass rush on Josh Freeman, uh, but I don't think they're going to be able to score points really on a not a great Bucks defense, but an average to good one. Eric, yeah, the Colts uh, Sunday night hung with hung with the Steelers to everyone's uh, you know we we had no idea we didn't even think that was possible. How do you think this game's going to turn out on Monday night? Well, I think if you're the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and you're a playoff team, you need to blow out the Colts. To be you honest, have to, right? I, mean, I think the Colts. Yeah, they played well against the Steelers, but that was at home. You know, it's easier to get up for games on a Sunday night at home. It's tougher to go to Tampa on the road on a Monday night again. Well, you can hear, by the way, here on ESPN 1080, uh, the home of the Bucks. And I think it's Tampa Bay. I agree with Andrew. That was a huge win last week against Atlanta to get over that hump against the Falcons. If you're the Bucks. You got a great opportunity to get to three and one, and really uh, get into you know try to start and get in a good position to make the playoffs. Uh, they should get a pretty good crowd actually for this game. I think a lot of people bought tickets in advance thinking Peyton Manning was going to play. Sure. So I think they'll have a, probably their biggest crowd they've had in a couple seasons, uh, and they'll have a good Monday night atmosphere. It's going to be an interesting day in Tampa St. Pete because obviously you have the Rays playoff game against the Rangers at 5 o'clock, as Carson told you in the last segment. He's going to the game. I'm going to the game uh, to see that game. And then the Bucks are playing at Monday night around 8.30. So it'll be an interesting night in Tampa St. Pete to see how the fans uh, kind of react to that. But I expect the Bucks to win by at least two scores. And they better win because it's at San Francisco next week, and then the schedule gets quite, quite difficult. Absolutely. No, you're right on that, and for crying out loud, it's Curtis Painter. Okay, so take our pick. I'm going Bucks. Melnick? Uh, Tampa. Buckman? Tampa. I'm going to go Tampa. And Lopez, you got Tampa? Yeah, we're going Tampa, and Carson's waving his Bucks flag going, go Bucks. All right, so I think that's a majority. I think that's a safe bet, too, Me meaning the the Bucks are a completely different team at home than they are away, I feel. I feel that that home field advantage really plays into their uh, their strong points. Okay, second, second matchup in the state of Florida, we got... The Saints at Jacksonville. Lopez, we'll start with you. What do you think? What do you? How do you see that game breaking Ooh. down? Blaine Gabbard's second start. Uh, they, they lifted the uh, the uh, blackout. There'll be a good crowd there to see the Saints play. And the first lifted blackout in Jacksonville in eight years. Yeah, and don't quote me on wish, that. A lot of some Jaguar fans might think they're going to wish it was blacked out because I think the Saints go all over the Jaguars. I think Blaine Gabbard's going to have to make some throws to stay in this game. Uh, he might get some opportunities, but Drew Brees is going to have a big game, which is bad news for me since I'm going up against him this week in my fantasy league. So uh, I'm kind of hoping Mark Ingram kind of picks up where Alabama left off last night, gets a couple scores in that game, and help my fantasy league team out. But I think the Saints are a heck of a football team. They had a good win against the Houston last week in a real good game. Their, uh, Drew Brees' offense is explosive. It's as good as anybody in the league right now. Uh, I think their defense will get a little better as the year goes on. They got they got to be a little worried about their pass defense, but they don't have they don't have to worry about it against Jacksonville this week. I think the Saints win pretty easily. Yeah, Jacksonville's got nothing at wide receiver. Mercedes Lewis is still banged up. You mentioned William Gabbert making his second start. I think this one could get real, real ugly. Uh, Drew Brees, for whatever reason, a little disappointing year last year after being probably the best player in the league the year before and leading the Saints to the Super Bowl. He looks like he's back playing at that level that he did two years ago. 
He's just been a monster so far this year. Uh, over a thousand yards and nine touchdowns already. I'd expect him to keep that up. I think the Saints win pretty easily. Well, in the latest here, it says Marcus Marquise Colston is uh, set to return to the Saints. Not that they needed him, but that's just another offensive weapon that they can hey, that's run big with. Fantasy football. Yeah, I got to go get Marquise I might have to go get Robert yeah. Meacham out of the lineup. Yeah, <laughs> you should see Melnick turned his head with the right. I didn't know that. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's huge fantasy info right there. I'm just reading that on a uh, ESPN.com right now. Okay. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, Jacksonville is, you know, Jacksonville with Blaine Gabbert being a rookie quarterback and, you know, not much around him. Uh, they still have Maurice Jones Drew on they, a they carry a, count, a carry count, whatever the heck that is now. Uh, I, I hope not. That guy, just want to see him healthy. Probably never gets quite the due he's deserved. That guy's an elite running back, has been since he started in the league, and I just want to see that guy get the ball as much as possible, and I'm sure Jaguar fans do too, keep that Saints offense off the field. Right, and of course Mercedes Lewis not having the the great of a season he did last year, but of course that he can contribute that to the quarterback play. Okay, so I'm going with Jacksonville. Take your pick. Melnick's going with? New Orleans. New Orleans. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to New Orleans. My bad. No, we're going to say No, 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 no. My bad. My bad. No, I'm, go- I'm going to New Orleans. Buckman, who do yeah, you got? I-, I don't think the Jags are going to ever win. So, right. Yeah. They're the worst team. Yeah. Lopez? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Me. Well, they have one. Maybe. All right. We're all agreeing. I, mean, from here, I didn't even know they had a win, to tell you the truth. They, uh, they beat the Titans. Nobody they really won. does. I-, I didn't even know that. Tennis. They beat the Titans. Exactly. All right. Well, hopefully we can disagree on this game. Miami is going to San Diego. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> really? Try, Brian. You know, th- I, I think the Dolphins are a different team on the road than they are at home. You know that. They are. What's their I, home record? One, I, one out of their last 11 or 12? They are. I mean, it, that's a good point. They've been much better on the road. But these cross-country games rarely ever work out for teams. Uh, just when you're heading to that... Uh, or that uh, time zone out there when you're coming from the East Coast. It just never really seems to work out. I mean, we saw the Jets get beat by Oakland last week out there. And San Diego, I think there's just too much talent. Well, Lopez, you're the big uh, Dolphins guy. Of course, yeah. Daniel Thomas, do you hear he's going to be out? Uh, no, you're, break- well, you're breaking fantasy news to everywhere. I'm breaking no, no, it, man. Daniel Thomas right. now i gotta, out. i got to make a phone call and bench Daniel Thomas. Uh, that means a little bit more Reggie Bush. Look, the Dolphins are a little better team on the road, but that didn't help them last week in Cleveland. As right. a Dolphin fan now, I'm at the point, let's just tank the season and get Andrew Luck. That's where I'm at right now at this point. Uh, there's some slogans that I'm not going to use on the air due to language, but uh, that's not really a language I like to suck use. on the air. Oh, you said it, not me. I, I think for Diego, is the slogan, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think the Dolphins will uh, they'll be a sloppy game. I think San Diego wins by 10. The bigger question is, will Tony Sperano be fired tomorrow if the Dolphins have a bye week next week? Don't be surprised if a move is made if the Dolphins are 0-4. I think I, that will happen. Right. C- because the bye week, you're saying? That yeah, per- it's the bye week. It's the perfect time to fire a coach, bring in an interim coach. You kind of leave it open. It allows you to talk to people during the season, uh, whoever they want to go to. They clearly didn't want Sperano back this season, but they kind of brought him back by default because they were turned down. It's I think like if they, they fired and rehired him in the middle of the offseason. I think that's a pretty fair assessment, Andrew, and uh, – I think that uh, they, uh, I think they lose to San Diego, and I think it'll be Tony Sperano's last game, and uh, we got to get in position to get Andrew Luck. Because if everybody knows, every team or every show needs a guy named Andrew. Yeah, a boy, absolutely. All right, we're gonna take our pick. You know what? I'm gonna shock the world. The only person not from Florida, I'm picking Miami. I'm picking oh, my. I'm you're picking, picking Miami. against your own city, Brian. Yes, yes. I don't. You're picking against your own city. Yes, I'm picking against my own state. I don't think the Chargers are a team that plays down to their competition. They don't want. They don't get fired up when a team at home when a team comes in at home. And I think I really do think Miami is a different team on the road. And I think they they can shock the world and surprise the world with this pick. The, the Chargers do play up and down the teams. I mean, I they think do. That, that close game they had with Kansas City it's last North week Turner. is a prime example. But I just think the talent difference, especially at quarterback, is is a little too much for the Dolphins to overcome. Buckman, what say you? I'm going uh, with the Philip Rivers yeah. crew. He's yeah. your boy. He's my, I mean, I wish the Giants never traded him. We'd, we'd have multiple multiple Super Bowls at this point. All right. Oh, well, geez, Buckman, quit hating on Eli Manning. He just ripped up the Eagle. He's got a Super Bowl ring for you. Come on. Ellie, give him a break. Ellie Manning? Come on. Guy? Eli Manning's a top-five quarterback, isn't he? At least in his mind. Yeah, in his mind. Right? He's as good as Tom Brady. He in is. His mind. Great segue, Melnick. Great segue. We're getting out of Florida right now. We're going to talk about one of my favorite so going players back out of all to time. Going back out to California. We got Patriots at Oakland. Okay, Patriots coming off that devastating last-minute field goal <laughs> loss by the Bills. Okay, 
But under under Belichick, though, they have not lost back to back games. So you know, I think that they're a team that th- no one works harder in the film room than, than the Patriots do. And I, I feel that Oakland is is back and better than ever. But um, you know, I, I like the Patriots in this game. I like Tom Brady. I think it's the, the spread. You see the over under is fifty five for this game. It's like a college football game. I've never seen I mean, an NFL spread that much. I think it's going to be a shootout, and I think the Patriots are going to win. They've been in shootouts the last couple weeks. So it's Oakland. You saw that Oakland-Buffalo. Uh, Raiders scored 34 points against the Jets last week. Darren McFadden has simply been, you know, I, I know Adrian Peterson will have something to say about it, and he should. I mean, that guy's the most talented best back. But Since 07. Due, due to him not getting the ball enough or whatever the problems there, poor quarterback play in Minnesota, Darren McFadden's been the most impressive running back so far this year. New England's defense has not been impressive, although they've been pretty good against the run. Uh, they didn't have Albert Hainsworth and Patrick Chung last week. Those guys are questionable. It looks like Hainsworth will probably be back to kind of shore up that middle with Vince Wilfork. So I think they'll not stop Darren McFadden, but slow Darren McFadden and maybe start to pull away later in the game. Lopez? Yeah, I agree with Andrew. My concern with New England, Andrew, and it's, you know, it's funny, I, I, you know, they their defense has got some holes. I think oh, their the, pass rush is still very suspect. The safety play was just awful. Well, Chung last was out. That hurt them. Chung being out last week really hurt them. Uh, Brady had four interceptions last week. Kind of hurt that. My How many he had moving, last season? Yeah, exactly. My question. I mean, a couple of things moving forward is: Can that defense get better, or is this going to be an issue all year? Number two is: Chad Ochocinco ever going to see uh, any production out of him? Uh, I, it seems right now that New England's content with just throwing to the tight ends and Wes Welker. Uh, Chad Ochocinco, you have to say, is a big bust right now, and I'm wondering if he even stays on the roster by the end of the year. No, if, if this keeps up, I don't think there's any question they'll they'll cut ties with him. I mean, they've done it in the past. I think the guy to watch for New England now, rookie Stephen Ridley out of LSU, got six carries last week, had a catch at 42 yards, 50 total yards. Uh, you know, with Ben Jarvis Green Ellis kind of lacking in production so far this year, I, I think Ridley's going to start taking a lot of carries. I, l- I love that nickname, the Law Firm. It is perfect. Ben Jarvis Green Ellis, it's great. But no, I agree with you. It's the Patriots. They're, I love them, but they're in trouble because they're going to have to put up thirty-eight to forty points a game because their defense is suspect. You know, oh, it yeah. totally is suspect. And the more the more you go down, you know, the season and stuff like that, it's. Defense wins championships. Yeah, and there's there's problems on the outside with the pass rush and at that safety. I mean, you're really wondering why they cut James Sanders and Brandon Merriweather now. At least could have kept one of them around. They cut Darius Butler too. Actually, in the in the off season, he was a former safety, played corner for him. Uh, they're good as it gets up the middle with Hainsworth, Wilfork, and Dry Mayo at, at linebacker, but everywhere else there's question marks. I, I can't disagree with that. Well, yeah, and I want to pose this question to both you and uh, and Lopez. Um, Especially the way the NFL is nowadays, how there are so many high-powered spread offenses, great quarterbacks, that that's going to make it even more difficult for for the Patriots to to win because they're going to be going up against these superstar quarterbacks who can put up points. Overall, I know it's real early, but uh, let's start with you, Lopez. How do you think the Patriots are going to do this season? Where do you see them finishing? Well, it's hard to say because I think it's them and the Jets, obviously, in the AFC East. I mean, no disrespect to Buffalo. I know they're off to a very good start. I don't expect them to maintain it. Uh, the rest of the year. I think it's going to be between New England and the Jets. Jets have some questions themselves. I mean, they got run over by Darren McFadden. Uh, that was very impressive. I think the Jets' front seven is a little suspect right now. I think they miss Sean Ellis a little bit. I think you can run on the Jets. So I think New England might win the division, but the thing is, everybody can throw now. It's a softer yeah. league in the NFL now with the rules changes. It's a very offensive-friendly league. Uh, everybody can throw the football. My Mark and Sanchez had 370 yards last week and a couple. Chad Henney had 400. Cam yeah. Newton, yeah. back-to-back 400-yard passing games. Yeah, that's the way the league is. It is the way the league is, and I think it'll catch up with New England. Uh, I like Baltimore and Pittsburgh right now in the AFC. To be honest, Baltimore they looked fantastic two of the three weeks. I know they lost to Tennessee, but they were flat after the emotional win over Pittsburgh. Flacco's looked pretty good. They got Torrey Smith, the rookie out of Maryland, which me and Andrew know pretty well. He's a good playmaker for them. Just Ray not. Rice is tremendous. Their defense still looks good. I think Pittsburgh's going to be okay. I know they didn't look great against Indy. They have they've been they, shaky all year so they far. They have been shaky. They have the offensive line issues. I think they'll find a way. They'll get it together. Uh, they got a tricky game in Houston today, though. That'll be an interesting test for both sides there. But I kind of like Baltimore right now. I think Baltimore has been the most impressive team to me in the AFC at least. All right, take your pick. Raiders are two and one overall. One and one and zero at home. Patriots two and one. One and one away. I'm going to go New England. Yeah, New England. I can't see Belichick losing two weeks in a row. 
I think they'll figure it out. And I think Brady will, Brady tends to bounce back after a bad game, after a four-interception game. I don't see that happening. I yeah, they really take win. those personally. Yeah, no, I, think, yeah, I think big game from Brady. I think New England wins something 38-24, 38-28, something like that. Well, I think the Patriots are the better team, I'm going to have to pick uh, the Raiders. Oakland? Why? You think McFadden's going to go off? Yeah, I just think McFadden. I have him on my fantasy team, and, and he's just somebody who, I mean, at the snap of a finger, he could – have 200 yards in a, in a hat, possibly. I mean, he, 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 you never know with him. And the Patriots' defense is a little, uh, you know, lack, lackluster, maybe? All right. Yes, they've, been, they've been all right against the run, though. Yeah. The, the, the Raiders have been able to throw a little better this year, too. they got a lot of speed on the outside. Uh, they're, they're an improved team. All right, Buckman's taking Oakland. I'm going with uh, New England, so 3-1. to one. All right, I'm going to throw you guys a curveball. We're going to go with the toilet bowl of the day. Vikings at Chiefs, both 0-3. Oh. Yes, both 0-3. Oh oh. Chiefs, I think, are the worst team in the NFL. Uh, lo- losing their, their their top two players, their best defensive player in Eric Berry, and their best offensive player in Jamal Charles. The Chiefs used to have this huge home field advantage at Arrowhead. That obviously isn't the case anymore. Who do you guys like in this one? Really? We have to pick this game? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, wow. for, for the Vikings, uh, they're relevant to me because I'm on Christian Ponder watch because Donovan McNabb has been absolutely awful, awful. and they're 0-3. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and go out on a limb and say Minnesota actually decides to continue giving carries to one of the best players in the NFL, and Adrian Peterson, in the second half. <laughs> going out which, on a limb Which there. they just don't do for whatever reason. Brad Childress didn't do it. Maybe that was Favre syndrome. But they haven't been doing it this year, despite how terrible McNabb's playing. I'm going to say they actually give him the ball in the second half, and they maintain a lead. Because Minnesota, you know, I know Kansas City was competitive last week with San Diego, but Minnesota's at least been competitive. They're up twenty to nothing last week. Yeah, they beaten themselves. They were up what seventeen nothing and ten, uh, against the Bucks. They were up seventeen seven against San Diego. They've at least been competitive, so I think the, you know they're not going to have to face another quarterback like a Matt Stafford, like a Josh Freeman, a Philip Rivers who can bring them back. They're going to be facing Matt Castle, who I'm I'm sorry to say, Eric, he might be the reason that your Dolphins don't wind up with Andrew Luck. Ooh. I agree with that. That's why I'm rooting for the Chiefs to win today. Let's get those Chiefs, baby, home field. I think the Vikings take the lead and blow it in the second half. <laughs> let's let's keep it happy. The Chiefs are due to win a game. They actually were in the San Diego game in some they ways, were. but um, I think they bounce. I think they win this game. I'm not sold on McNabb. I agree with Andrew. I think it's only a matter of time before Christian Ponder uh, gets in for Minnesota because they're going nowhere. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. They've been a big disappointment. I mean, Peterson. I mean, he's tremendous, and yet they can't win. They blow leads. Their defense is not what it was. Secondary is old. I think the Chiefs, they're going to win a couple of games, and I think this is one of them, and uh, help the Dolphins get in the lead for Andrew Luck. See, I agree with that. I, th- I think it, it's very telling when a couple years ago when Andy Reid and, and the Philadelphia Eagles got rid of McNabb and actually tr- traded him within the division. Right then and there, that, tell, that told me that they thought McNabb was done yeah, and washed I mean, up. McNabb's probably the third best quarterback from that team now. Right. What Kevin Cobb's doing in Arizona and, and what Mike Vick's doing in Philadelphia. Right, so that's going to be a very interesting game. I, I think the Vikings are to win just because I think the Chiefs are that bad. And, yes, I believe that they do have the best running back in the NFL, Adrian Peterson. And I hope they go with him. But, uh, yeah, I see. I take the Vikings on this. Mel, Nick, you Yeah, got, I got the Vikings. Lopez, you're going with the Chiefs just because you want Miami to uh, get Andrew Luck, right? That's right, baby. Andrew Luck, come to Miami, baby. It's a nice come bu- to Miami. Come to South Beach. Buck That's right. Got. I- I'm taking the Vikings, although... Uh, I don't know about Christian Ponder, but that's for another show, I guess. Oh, I, I'm not saying how effective or not he's going to be. I'm just saying we're going to be seeing him pretty soon if oh, this, I agree. If this I keeps agree. up. Okay. All right. We've got time for one more game here. We're going we're gonna to talk about McNabb's old team, the quote-unquote dream team. We've got, we got a minute left. Is that not biting them in the you-know-what right now? No, never. The dream ever, team? Everyone knew it was going to, too. As soon as right. It, what the funniest part of it. Is it's Vince Young that said it <laughs> exactly backup quarterback that's been hurt. I mean, the it's third, not like yeah, it's the not third like string Vic quarterback came out and said it, or Deshaun Jackson, or one of their actual you know superstar players. Right, and you know, and I was one of these guys too that thought I just don't trust Vic's durability. I never have. I never have. And it's I agree, all- Brian. I agree, hundred percent. It's a great point. All right, well, we got twenty seconds. I'm going with the Eagles. Yeah, e- Eagles. Forty Nine ers just can't score. I'm going Forty Nine ers because I can't we're, stand the Eagles. We're going Forty Nine ers. We're going to Eagles. The Giants Eagle. fan took the Eagles. By the way. That was uh, Eric Lopez, host of the ESPN1080.com Insider Show. Eric, thanks for joining us. That's right. Check out ESPN1080.com for post-game Florida, Alabama. Me and Brent.